This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Yaval Levin, and glad to welcome him back to Liberty Law Talk, his new book, The Fractured Republic, Renewing America's Social Contract in the Age of Individualism. Yaval Levin is the Hertog Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He's the, he's the founding editor and current editor of National Affairs, a former White House congressional staffer and contributing editor to National Review and the Weekly Standard. He's also the author of a great book, The Great Debate, Thomas Paine, Edmund Burke, and the Birth of Right and Left. Yuval Levin, glad to have you on the program. Thank you very much for having me back. So you open the book with um, a significant passage from Edmund Burke, from, excuse me, Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. And I wanted to read a portion of that and get your comment on it, because I think it nicely illustrates and telegraphs where you're going in this book. So Tocqueville says, to instruct democracy, if possible, to reanimate its beliefs, to purify its mores, to moderate its movements, to substitute little by little an understanding of affairs for its inexperience. Such is the first duty imposed on those who would guide society in our day. A new political science is needed for a world altogether new, but that is what we hardly dream of. Placed in the middle of a rapid river, we obstinately fix our eyes on some debris we still perceive on the bank, while the current carries us away and takes us backward toward the abyss. You have all many would say right now the American Republic, and the title of your book uh, hints at this, is a nation so badly divided uh, that it seems hard, at least if we take a short view, to see how we put ourselves back together, many questioning whether there is even a consensus that holds the country together. Uh, recent political events, of course, don't even need comment. So are we that country that, that Tocqueville describes here, uh, you know, hurling down a river, moving fast down a rapid river, and desperately searching for something to, to give ourselves stability and, and relocate ourselves, and yet uh, we're unable to do that because we're missing uh, the future, we're missing where we should be looking if we're going to hold the country together? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, that, that passage from the introduction to Democracy in America so appealed to me because it, it really does seem to me to describe an awful lot of the situation we're in. The argument of the book was deeply shaped by Tocqueville. I think that should be clear to anybody who reads the book and has read Democracy in America. Shaped by Tocqueville in a number of ways. I think, first of all, um, in the sense that's suggested in that passage, which is that um, Tocqueville was concerned that people in his time, looking at the at the democratic age that was dawning, could only see the age that had passed and were not able to come to terms with what was probably unchangeable about the present so that they could think about what could be changed and how society could be adapted to thrive in a new situation. Um, but also shaped by Tocqueville in that the, the, the source of hope that um, that I think we do have, and ultimately this is a hopeful book, not an optimistic book, but a hopeful book. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that the, the source of hope that I find is influenced by Tocqueville and is similar to the one Tocqueville found, which is that ultimately I think self-government can work provided that it is not overly centralized or overly individualized, but that it finds its sources of strength at the level of community. And in, in both those respects, I think Tocqueville has an enormous amount to teach us. And w- when I sort of finished writing this book and stepped back from it, I ju- I, it, it was perfectly clear to me that this was just a function of my reading Tocqueville and then looking at the 21st century. And so the book does begin with that uh, quote from his introduction, which is so powerful. So the title of your book, a provocative one, um, uh, also one that will sell books, I think, uh, <laughs> The Fractured Republic. What do you mean by The Fractured Republic, and uh, you know. Also, we can talk about related to this the politics of nostalgia that you say guides us both on the left and right. Yeah, so uh, I, I think a lot of the frustration that is so powerful now in our politics is a function of the nostalgic character of our political debates, the way that the left and right, in different ways, 
look back to a certain kind of um, of 20th century moment as the model, as the as the model of 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 what a functional America looks like, and are looking in different ways to recover that, to return to it, rather than looking at what 21st century America really is. And one of the ways of describing how America has changed since that moment in the middle of the 20th century, um, that moment that's still so much a focal point for us, is to understand it in terms of the fracturing or fragmentation of what was a very cohesive, consolidated society. The United States that came out of the Second World War and the Depression was intensely cohesive and consolidated, and not just because of the war and the Depression, but really I argue in the, in the first half of the book that the, the forces acting on American society in the first half of the 20th century almost all drove everyone to become more like everyone else, whether it's the growing scale of the industrial economy, whether it's uh, progressive politics, whether it's the rise of truly mass media um, that created all kinds of genuinely uh, mass cultural experiences for the public, all of it brought this um, diverse, divided country together and emphasized solidarity and unity in ways that were very unusual for the United States. And the country that came out of that process in the middle of the 20th century was intensely cohesive and was dominated by a few large institutions, a big government, big business, big labor, working together to manage the country, um, and had enormous confidence in those institutions, unlike anything that we have now and really any of our national institutions. Over the, over the past half century and more, um, we've gone from that society to a society that, rather than a few large institutions, is dominated by many more but smaller players and niches and grooves uh, in economics, in the culture. We now have vastly more options and choices, but at the same time, less predictability, less security. We have more diversity, but less unity. And, you know, everything in American life now can be personalized, but we have less in common. So in a lot of ways, we've been fractured and fragmented. This has been both good and bad, and the, the book really tries to argue against the notion that it's all been a disaster. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot about it that we value enormously, but because we're so nostalgic, we don't see either the good or the bad very clearly. Yeah, you have a, a quote in there, uh, America is getting better and worse at the same time, and yet frequently amongst conservatives, we know those are, those are well-worn complaints. Uh, about sort of the decline of America, uh, particularly with uh, social, religious, cultural mores and habits, yeah. dispositions. And then among the left, we have an economic critique, uh, which you've, you've just sort of hinted at. And, and so we miss those good old days of, uh, uh, of private sector unions, of large industrial cities, which then they also say actually provided the basis for the things that conservatives like, namely stable uh, family yeah. life and all those sorts of things. And so... Yeah, we, but I think, you know, also it's what we also fail to realize is this is an America heavily constructed by government at right. mid-century. And you make that point uh, repeatedly in your book. And, uh, you know, also even uh, it seems less noted by the right is the way that social policy in the New Deal, uh, family policy, labor mm -hmm. policy was right. incredibly conservative. Alan Carlson has written about this at length. Yep. Uh, your, your friend Ross Douth at Ryan Salam have also in the book uh, Grand New Party, and it make this made this known. And so we have an America put together in many respects, also by a war, which America right. emerged triumphant from. And so, in in many ways, that moment itself is is the creation of government, and maybe what we're living in now, this sort of diffusion, deconsolidation, decentralization that you talk about, is actually more consistent with. Uh, the type of country uh, that we were, you know, set to become or always yeah. meant to become, which was uh, an incredibly diverse nation held together by, you know, some fundamental concepts and ideas, but one where there was a lot of play at the joints. I think it's absolutely right, and it's really a, a kind of central argument of the book that a lot of the ways we analyze our society now, and even the best analysts of our society, uh, people like Charles Murray, who I think is in a incredibly important person to, to read and understand if you're going to think yeah. about American life, um, or people like uh, Bob Putnam, the, the kind of people that we might look to to think about the country's problems. Um, 
they tend to begin from mid-century. And so if you think about uh, Coming Apart, Murray's really fantastic book, that book, when you step back from it and look at it, is a book of charts about how America has changed since 1960. And there's a lot to learn about that, but there's an implicit assumption there that the America of 1960 was the epitome of American life. Um, and in a sense also that America was like that before the middle of the 20th century, and that something broke down, and we've since then uh, become less American. I think, in fact, and I argue in the book, that the America of the middle of the 20th century was extremely unusual. Um, it was very unusual for all the reasons we've been talking about, because of the war, because of the Depression, because of uh, industrialization and progressivism. Um, <clears throat> it was an exceptionally unified society, and also, by the way, because of extremely low immigration for a very long time, so that by, by the end of the 60s, about 4% of the people living in the United States had been born abroad, which is certainly the lowest, uh, the lowest percentage in American history. And what we've come to now is a little bit more like what America was before that period. And, and what you might have found at any point in the 19th century is an America that was extremely diverse, highly divided, um, with very little faith in its institutions. I think if you had been able to take a poll of Americans at any point in the 19th century and ask them what they thought about Congress, you know, the approval rating would have been about 2%. Um, you can find this in, uh, in, in political writing of the time. We didn't have polling to work with, but people had extremely low opinion of the national government, of politicians, um, of business, of all the institutions that we now have a lot of doubts about. And so I do think we've come back to something more like what America was before, um, before progressivism and before that mid-century moment. The difference is that we've arrived at this moment as the nation that experienced that moment. We've arrived at yeah. this moment as a nation transformed by progressivism, transformed by the experience of the 20th century. Um, and so we are less prepared to be that country than the America of the 19th century that uh, had reached it in a very different way. And among other things, our mediating institutions, our civil society, um, has been worn down and broken by a hundred years of first intense consolidation and centralization, and then intense individualism, both of which have weakened those mediating institutions that are so central to freedom. Yeah, no, it's interesting listening to you talk and think about, so if we think about the America before the New Deal or before World War II, and even, so we're about a hundred years out, a little over a hundred years from uh, another incredibly uh, fractious, intense presidential election of 1912, right? Uh, you know, which saw a third-party candidate, which saw sort of the Republican Party splintering apart. And so, I mean, not to make a facile historical comparison, but it's interesting there. You mentioned Charles Murray. I have to ask you this: in the way Charles Murray has analyzed uh, Donald Trump's thinkers, he had another important piece this week on National yep. Review about that. Uh, so, Damon Linker recently reviewed your book. Uh, in, in the week, and he noted, although he said you had to turn your book in, obviously probably a year ahead of time, um, but there's one noticeable absence. How, do, how does Yuval Levin deal with Trump in the yeah. framework of this book? I can imagine a couple of ways uh, it going, but I, I want to see, hear what you have to say. Well, so I, uh, I, have been shy, I, I haven't been shy about Trump. I, uh, it's, he's not in the book, but I've certainly been clear that I think that he is, uh, well, that he's not someone I could vote for, that he's not someone who represents uh, anything like what I uh, believe about America or what conservatism ought to be. Trump's not in the book for the simple reason that uh, that review suggested, which is the book was written before he was, uh, mostly before he was running, but certainly before it was clear that he uh, would be the great force that he's become in this election year. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Trump is is a symptom of the problem I've, I've been describing. I don't think that he's a cure or a treatment for it, but I think he's an example in a couple of ways. First of all, in that he is himself as a force in our politics intensely nostalgic. Um, Trump, in, in a way, takes the nostalgic logic of contemporary politics to a kind of absurd degree, so where Democrats um, tend to be nostalgic for the period of the early 60s when we had a kind of uh, social liberalization amidst a very consolidated economy. Republicans often miss the early 80s when it seemed like you could have a kind of resurgence of that, uh, that mid-century strength, but without the emphasis on government. Donald Trump doesn't even specify exactly what he means when he say make America great again. But it's clear that it is a kind of baby boomer nostalgia 
for the kind of America that our politics in general so longs for. And you hear it, you know, he goes to Pittsburgh and says he's going to bring steel back. And you just have to think this this is not a person who is looking around at the 21st century. Pittsburgh doesn't even want steel back at this point. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, they're doing pretty well. They're actually kind of a model of how, uh, of how, the, of, of how coal country and steel country could recover. Um, but you know, th- there's a kind, th- there's a, there's implicit in everything that he says this idea that America is just not what it used to be, and that by rolling back um, modern trends, by rolling back immigration, by rolling back trade, by rolling back the effects of globalization, we can be great again. Rather than thinking about how um, America can can be its best self again in this situation in the 21st century, so I think Trump is. Uh, appealing very powerfully to that sense and to people who are especially nostalgic in our politics. Um, but, you know, the opening created for him um, is itself a function of the failure of the two parties, and in his case especially the Republican Party, to speak to people's concerns in the 21st century and to yeah. connect with American realities at this point. Voters have a sense, and I think it's a justified sense, that our politics is just disconnected from reality and is not speaking to where they are. Now, I don't think it, it, that justifies turning to Donald Trump. Uh, I just don't. I think Republican voters made a terrible mistake yeah. uh, in this yeah. primary season, and uh, the country is going to pay for that mistake one way or another. Yeah. But the the underlying um, the, the underlying anxiety and frustration um, certainly is more understandable. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, hearing you uh, say this. So Trump is a part of the nostalgia. And and the opening for Trump is created. Thinking about your analysis in the book, you say the Republican Party is it's it's kind of always 1981. Yeah, uh, it's I mean, always if you think about the, yeah. the alternative to Trump in this primary. Ultimately, the 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 real alternative turned out to be Ted Cruz. And um, not you know, a, there's a lot uh, to like about Ted Cruz. I do like Ted Cruz, but Ted Cruz really did offer the 1980s as an alternative um, to Trump to to the Democrats. And, you know, was incapable of finishing a sentence without referring to Ronald Reagan. Now, there's a lot to like about Ronald Reagan, but I think that if we see what Reagan did, Reagan really did try to apply a set of conservative principles to the specific challenges and problems of the late 70s and uh, and the 80s. And if we were to do that same thing now, the result would not exactly be Reaganism. Um, And so to just try to repeat the agenda that he ended up with um, strikes me as a mistake, and I think it strikes voters as inadequate. Yeah, interesting um, in thinking about Trump. And so if, if Yuval says he's a part of the nostalgia uh, that, that you're critiquing, uh, interesting listening to Peter Thiel's current interview with Bill Kristol, where while he doesn't, you know, it just, just his analysis, uh, Peter Thiel says, it, it may be that globalization has run its course, that we have, uh, you know, taken all of the gains, the big gains that we can get out of it, certainly the gains that would justify the inherent costs uh, and downsides of globalism uh, through, through these trade agreements. And, um, you know, maybe that's just we've done all the, all the big stuff we're going to do uh, uh, with, with, with economic globalization. And it's just either, either it stays the same, it doesn't, we don't really do more in terms of increased trade flows, or, or it starts to recede. Certainly, there seems to be an idea in the air, particularly if we look at the European Union uh, when, and thinking about sort of the decline of nation states, that, that yeah. that's largely ended. Um, or at least we see signs that people actually do want to recover politics of the nation state. So could Trump actually be, and with all of, you know, and it's easy to see a lot of horrific consequences resulting from it, could Trump actually be, though, uh, his campaign, and then you're looking at the rise of these nationalist parties in countries in Europe, sort of the end of a period that's been in play for about 20 years since the end of the Cold War, and we're seeing you know, something like uh, nation-states versus cosmopolitanism. Yeah. Well, I, I, mean, you know, I, I think that this tension between, between nationalism and uh, cosmopolitanism is, is longstanding, and on that front, I certainly find myself on the side of nationalism. I just don't think that American nationalism needs to look like Trumpism. Um, I don't think that that's what it's looked like when it succeeded, and I don't think that it makes sense for it to look like that in the 21st century, but I certainly do agree 
that a recovery of the idea of the nation and of the reality of the nation, not just America as a theoretical idea, but America as our country that has to come first in our politics, is absolutely essential for the recovery of our political life in general um, and is essential to a healthy political life in any society. So in that sense, I do okay. think that this speaks to real tensions and real pressures and justified concerns. I just think it speaks to it in the wrong way and draws the wrong lessons out of it. Um, you know, America's, America is going to thrive in the 21st century by recovering its best self, by recovering constitutionalism, by recovering a kind of confidence in its ability um, to, to, uh, to, to, to thrive again as a great commercial republic. And it seems to me that Trump stands in the way of that more than he advances it. But certainly it's true that the opening that's made him possible um, is a failure of the, the phase of our politics that I think is coming to an end, as he suggests. So I want to get into, uh, although you don't, you know, there's no real, I kept waiting for the policy list. Um, yeah. And, and I know, and, and you're a well-known member of this new movement of the reform conservatives. Uh, <laughs> yeah, obviously. I tried not to make and that's, too. and I know, and I know you guys have a book of policy proposals, and we can yeah. also say the journal you edit, National Affairs, yeah. one could just simply dump out issues of that on someone's desk and say, here are our policy ideas. So I, I know that those are all out there. Uh, mm-hmm. but I, I was looking for your policy list, but getting into sort of, maybe the more nuts and bolts aspect of of this book. So one way to do that, and I think it's an important point you make in the book, and it begins with Tocqueville, uh, but also with thinkers like uh, Robert Nisbet, um, among others, you note that, and we see this with conservatives, we see this with libertarians, that the battle is between, they say, individualism versus collectivism. Why is that wrong? Well, so a couple of things. First of all, to the, to the general point, um, I, 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 in, in a sense, I, I, it's my hope that the book functions as, um, that, that the book works to elicit a question to which uh, National Affairs, the journal I edit, and some of the work that's done, as you say, by a uh, kind of circle of reform-minded people on the right, would be the answer. So my hope is that a, a reader gets this book and says, well, okay, now where's the agenda? And then, as you suggest, I can... I can dump 5,000 pages of national <laughs> affairs on their desk, and uh, and there it is. Because I do think that that side of things has been has been uh, started well, and in a sense, what's been lacking is the underlying vision, is what unifies um, these ideas. A lot of people had looked at that kind of reformism on the right and said, um, "This is just this is just technocratic. It's programmatic. This is just public policy. Uh, it doesn't seem like a vision of of political life in America." And to me, that vision's always been what actually drives the policy ideas and what unites them. And so the book, in a sense, is an attempt to uh, provide that, to articulate that undergirding vision that's, uh, that, that's been what drives us in this kind of reform circle, or at least what drives me. I don't want to speak for others. Um, so I hope it does raise a question to which the work we've been doing over the last uh, yeah. decade or so might be the answer. Um, and, and, and so the... To, to your specific question, it seems to me um, that the, the next step for our public policy and the way to simultaneously reconnect it with the American constitutional tradition on the one hand and, on the other hand, modernize it, make it a better fit for 21st century life in America, um, is a decentralization of the way we think about public policy is moving from a progressive vision that says that American society consists of individuals and a national government. And the purpose of the national government is to make radical individualism more sustainable, which it seems to me is roughly what 21st century progressivism says, uh, or at least means. Instead, to think about the way we solve problems um, as as a kind of bottom-up approach to um, to public policy, allowing people where they are, where they confront problems, to have some power and resources to try their hand at different solutions to those problems, rather than standing around with their arms folded, waiting for the federal government to create the right program. And in a lot of ways, that's actually what conservatives have been offering for a long time. So as an alternative to the liberal welfare state, conservatives again and again have offered ways of enabling people to make choices that move our various uh, systems of public policy in the right direction. 
that's what school choice looks like as opposed to a centralized uh, notion of public schooling. That's what conservative ideas on health care look like as opposed to Obamacare. That's what welfare reform can look like. Um, I think that, that that logic needs to be applied essentially in every domestic policy arena, not only because empowering those mediating institutions is the way to let people live free lives um, and make decisions that at the same time make them better citizens, but also because there's just a better way to solve the practical problems we have. The progressive welfare state is built on the model of the industrial economy. Um, mm -hmm. and presumes, the, presumes a growing population and a growing economy. Exactly. And, 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 that and presumes, a very capable government at the center of it all. Instead of a sclerotic um, government. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, it, you know, I mean, if you think about what Hillary Clinton is proposing, all of it assumes very capable institutions and a public that has enormous faith in those institutions. And we don't have either of those things. Instead, the way we solve problems in the 21st century is by giving people lots and lots of options and choices and letting their decisions make for incremental improvements. Um, and so in that respect, I think conservatives are actually especially well positioned to help the country solve problems in the 21st century if we can see that that's what we're offering, if we can understand the appeal of our own message in that way, it seems to me we really do have a lot to offer. Yes, I mean, in a way, that's been the contradiction of the Obama presidencies. We have this decentralizing, diffuse, individualistic society, and we get, with one of the major policy challenges in our country, we get Obamacare. Yeah, exactly. um, and, and so with finance, rather than allowing a further decentralization of finance, we get Dodd-Frank, which attempts to consolidate and shore up the existing financial structure, yeah. as many people have noted. And, and, and then with entitlements, we get massive entitlement spending with exactly. Social Security and, and Medicare. You know, we, see, we see Hillary Clinton wanting to, I think, increase these entitlements. I don't know what planet yeah. she lives on. But, but now let's, let's think about your ideas here. Subsidi you talk about subsidiarity. You talk about strengthening the middle layers of our society, and yet those, you also know, are the weakest parts of our society. As yep. we have bought into this logic, going back to the question I asked you earlier, uh, collectivism and individualism, you note know they work together. Uh, that, yep. So to say that we're going to have a battle between collectivist government and individualism ignores a certain idea I love the way you frame it about the question of freedom. So many on the American right assume it's just about removing coercion and all will be well, spontaneous order, da, 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 da. And you know, freedom requires moral formation and requires living in groups, doing things with others, uh, freely, responsibly, of course, but requires that aspect and requires people to experience consequences of bad actions. And that's how we develop the free society. But that sort of thick conversation, I rarely see outside of... You know, your yep. book and, and a few others um, is, isn't really part of the equation. So maybe talk about that, but talk about this middle layer stuff and, uh, and how that works. I mean, obviously, you know, to give us policy ideas, but how, how do we see that yep. shaping America? Yeah, I mean, for me, this is also a very Tocquevillian idea. Um, and, you know, I think the people who have made this argument, like Robert Nisbet, like a few others, uh, have also seen it themselves as a very Tocquevillian way to understand the nature of the free society. Um, essential to it first, as you say, is understanding that individualism and collectivism are two sides of the same coin, that they, they reinforce one another, they make each other necessary. And what progressivism is at this point is really an argument for moral individualism and economic and political collectivism. Not collectivism in the communist sense, but the idea that things should be centralized in order to enable moral individualism. And I, I think a lot of people on the left genuinely understand this combination to be the definition of freedom. Um, yeah. moral, moral individualism uh, and a kind, of, uh, a kind of economic collectivism feels like freedom because it allows people to not have too many responsibilities in either realm. Um, but it, it seems to me that ultimately freedom isn't really possible without responsibility. And the book ends by trying to articulate an understanding of freedom that it seems to me is just necessary for a free society to really function and thrive, an understanding of freedom not only as liberation from constraint or from obligation, which is what our kind of libertarian idea of freedom on both the left and the right really is at this point, but an understanding of freedom 
as requiring a population of citizens who are capable of making responsible choices freely so that we don't require coercion uh, to sustain social order. And that, that prerequisite, that population of citizens, which we so easily take for granted, is really, it seems to me, the greatest achievement of, um, of, of the liberal society. And it's a social achievement. It's not a natural phenomenon. That person does not just exist in nature. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a conservative. I start out with a pretty low opinion of the human creature. Um, I think humanity has great possibilities, is made in the divine image, but uh, ultimately is uh, driven by uh, vice and uh, is, is prone to enormous excess and disorder. And w- w- that person is turned into a creature capable of living in a free society by that society, by institutions that form us for freedom, that make us responsible, that, um, that, that curb our excesses, that drive us toward a kind of cooperation that's essential for a free society to function. And the institutions that do that are exactly the institutions that fill the middle space between the individual and the state. The family, first and foremost, um, the community, the church and synagogue, um, but also work, also uh, civic organizations, associations of workers like unions, associations of businesses, um, and also local governments, and also our free economy. These institutions are necessary for us to be able to remain a free society. And so the fact that it is exactly these institutions that get worn down and weakened in, uh, in, in the kind of society that, um, that, that progressivism envisions and that we've become over time is an enormous problem. Um, and so for that reason, as well as, again, for the more practical reasons that it's a better way to solve the kinds of problems we have, I think that sending some power and resources and authority back down toward the local level is essential. And here again, I'm very much informed by Tocqueville. He has a wonderful image in the second volume of Democracy in America um, of the way in which allowing local decisions to matter draws people in to, uh, in that case, local government, but also civic associations and all of these middle institutions, where he says, you know, people aren't going to care unless it matters to them. So if you build a road through someone's property, he's going to show up at the meeting. Um, and if all those decisions are made very far away from him, he has nowhere to show up and he has no reason to pull himself out of the little tiny circle that his individualism has created around himself. But if you allow what he does together with his neighbors to matter, he will be drawn out of himself. And so these mediating institutions pull both up and down. Um, They make sure that we don't become too centralized at the national level. They also make sure that we don't become too isolated at the individual level. Well, the question, though, and just thinking about, and, and, and maybe uh, it, it was unclear to me how government is a part of this, or, or beyond just, say, relinquishing power back to the local, which seems that, that in and of itself is, is going to be a struggle. Um, sure. But these institutions are incredibly weak, uh, as you note. I mean, family, as Charles Murray has said, uh, family is really strong in upper middle class America. Uh, and, and I think that, and that's, that's evident to me. It's interesting to me. Uh, it's pretty yeah. weak uh, once you get in the bottom half of American life. And even, you know, Murray has said, uh, you know, the wor- working, you know, working class families are sh- you know, shot through with problems, but it's even starting to migrate into the middle yeah. class. So the question... Uh, how does one reinvigorate uh, the family, particularly when so much of that is about habits and learning through being raised in it, et cetera? How does one reinvigorate a lot of community institutions outside of, say, suburbia, where they're they're still fairly strong? Uh, yeah. And then, of course, religion um, uh, continue, you know, does it, it seems, you know, yes, yeah, it depends. It depends, you know, um, where you're at as to how strong those institutions are and uh, et cetera. So um, talk about that reinvigorating because you, you really do want, I think, a, a politics of relational personhood, maybe that's my yep. term, yep, to, to take hold uh, as opposed to either big government and individualism uh, to, to, be, to be sort of the default setting. And, you know, what, what seems to further fill me with dread and pessimism on my worst days is thinking about these people are, you know, who are like a decade younger than me in their 20s, who seem to be largely buying that logic that most of the big decisions in their lives should be made by the government. 
and and sort of you know Nordic style, like the government will give them pocket change for running around and entertaining themselves, but most of the big stuff will be government, and they seem to be buying into that. It seems to me, uh, and so you know all that. I'll just throw that at you. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. I'm I'm a little less pessimistic than that, um, and I you know I would say. Hope and optimism are different things. Um, I am hopeful, but optimistic is not something we should let ourselves fall into to just expect things to get better. I think we should we should believe that the resources for improvement exist and they require us to act uh, and make use of them. And that's what hope really means to me. I, I think that, um, well, I'd say a couple of things to all of that. I, I, I think that it's certainly true that government can't be at the center of solving these problems. And if we ever found ourselves trying to think of public policy that would make for religious revival, um, we should stop right away and turn (laughs) around and go and do something else. Um, I do think that there are ways of decentralizing the institutions we have for addressing the problems that confront the poor um, that would help on this front, too, by, by allowing um, resources to flow much more from the bottom up than the top down, by allowing decisions about how to use resources um, to, be made, uh, in, uh, to be made at the, at the community level in very diverse ways, not just in order to find an answer and then impose it on the whole country, not as pilot programs, but to allow for a genuinely diverse approach to how we address the problems of uh, poverty in America. Um, I do think that a lot of the solutions that would arise if that were how our system worked um, would be solutions that made use of institutions that were useful for much more than just moving money around. Um, Institutions that create around themselves communities with a certain kind of moral character. And ultimately, to the extent that what's necessary is to help people make better decisions, and that's not all it takes um, to solve the sorts of problems we have, but it's an important part of what it takes. Those kinds of changes are not going to happen as a result of subtle uh, economic incentives, right? The, the decision to get married or to stay with the mother of your child is not really going to be a function of some little tax incentive that you kind of see out of the corner of your yeah. eye. Those kinds of decisions are a function of the community that you live in, of what seems to you to be what everybody does in your situation, what your neighbors are going to think is the right thing to do, and what your neighbors are going to think is a terrible thing to do. And that means that allowing communities with, with a certain kind of moral character to take a part, to play a role in trying to help people um, address their economic problems allows them to also play a role in helping people address other kinds of problems. And so I do think that decentralization can, in general and in subtle ways, um, help advance this cause. Now, surely it is true that um, a lot of the problems we have would be a lot less bad if we were in the midst of a great religious revival, and that would be a wonderful thing. I don't think we can order that up through yeah, public yeah, yeah. policy. Um, and so you know, we have to understand the limits of what uh, we can do in these ways and try to make the most of them. Yeah, we think about um, your analysis. You talk about the unbundled market, the unbundled economies, and you talk about four trends uh, within our economic life, globalism, automation, uh, immigration, and uh, you don't have a nifty term for it for the fourth yeah, thing. But I, I think I think one way is the 1099 revolution, that is exactly. uh, contract contract for higher employees rather than Full-time employees, you have to pick up all their benefits and et cetera. Um, uh, talk about, I mean, those four trends, I think, are all evident, are leading to the unease, uh, particularly for low-skilled and middle-skilled workers. Uh, and, and in the automation, it seems to me it's increasingly the case that a many white sco- white-collar positions will be will be automated, uh, will be will be digitized, will be taken over, even, you know, you see the robotics revolution. So <clears throat> one, you know, Tyler Cowen has hinted that the people who will make money in our country uh, in the next uh, generation or next half century will either be inventors or, or those who can profitably manage the inventors' marketing, uh, you know, manage the talent, et cetera. 
And so, and that's if that's true, that's a that's a really difficult reality to believe in. Yeah, that's very uh, grim, and Tyler seems awfully uh, content to see it happen. But and it also seems to contradict his first book, which was a stagnation thesis. So, are we stagnating, or are we in the midst of a robotics revolution? I I don't know if anyone's ever asked him that. But no, leaving that aside, how does the middle layers subsidiary solution of Yuval Levin address these very hard? Uh, uh, realities yep. that are, in many respects, just being driven by a very free market. Well, I'd say this. Ultimately, I'm I'm just not as pessimistic about how this goes as uh, as Tyler is. Although I would say Tyler Cowen doesn't take himself to be a pessimist, and maybe he's not. Um, but I, I don't see it quite the same way. I I, I think that um, there's always been an inclination to look at capitalism and think the way this system is going, there aren't going to be any jobs. Um, th- th- that's what um, that's what the the mechanization of agriculture looked like in the 19th century. Yeah. Um, that's what a lot of industrialization at first looked like. But ultimately, these changes create jobs, even as they um, make other jobs uh, obsolete. And the challenge is to allow workers to have the kind of skills they need for the particular sorts of jobs that are created. And I do think that one key to that in the situation we're in now, because it's so dynamic and unpredictable, is that um, w- we think about especially education and, and especially higher education um, in, in a rather different way than we have tended to, and that we allow our higher education system to evolve to meet the needs of the 21st century economy and to evolve to help workers um, better align their skills with the 21st century economy. So I, I think at this point, the, the relationship between public policy and higher education is very constricting. Um, yeah. We've come to a place where the way that higher ed is financed means that we're stuck in a certain kind of model that was designed to provide um, the mid-century economy with workers. And as things have changed, it's been very hard for higher education to change. And this has been bad both for higher education as a means of providing skills and for higher education as a means of educating citizens. Um, that is the kind of liberal education that I think is essential, too. And so it seems to me that the, the economic model of higher ed is, is in the process of imploding. And that um, for people who think about public policy, it's important that to the degree that uh, that that our public policy toward higher ed changes, it allows people to have a lot more flexibility, a lot more options, and a kind of freedom from the generic four-year model that our student loan system is built to to handle. I think the challenge is going to be providing people with skills to, um, to, to fill the new jobs. It is not going to be that there are no new jobs. Um, mm-hmm. That's you know, it's going to be some mix of those. I mean, we clearly are having trouble um, employing everyone in our society, and employment levels are awfully low. I think the idea that there would be a transition for existing workers, especially older male workers, mm-hmm. um, from those old jobs to the new jobs has proven to be an enormous challenge. Job retraining is just something politicians say. It has never worked at all. Yeah. Um, and so these problems are very real, but if we think about the opportunities available to the next generation, I think we can do a lot better if we enable our system of higher ed um, to be more adaptable and more flexible. Yeah, and, and just getting beyond, I mean, it, it's interesting when we come back to Obama, right, uh, you know, really trying to further embed loans uh, as, yep. a, as a financing mechanism to keep pushing people through higher education. But I suppose it's also explains a lot of things we've been talking about, you know, one of which is the living memory of an America that provided, uh, you know, great employment for all sorts of people. Right. And, and now we have uh, at least everything you see. I mean, you, you talk about middle income wages rising uh, over the past 20 or 30 years. Yeah, other people argue that hasn't happened. And in particular for, for said lower skilled workers, that hasn't happened yep. as globalism has taken off. And but you know all of this does seem to spark, t- to my mind, just the the question of where do we go from here, mm-hmm. uh, in that regard. And it seems to me no one has a good answer. I think that's right. It's a very open question. Um, you know, I, 
it, it, it's uh, it's reasonably likely that the most dire of the pessimists and the most hopeful of the optimists are wrong, just as a general matter. Yeah. But um, it's 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 a, a very open question. There's an extraordinary amount of basic disagreement among economists about where the labor market is headed. Yeah. So, I mean, and just, uh, you know, overall, uh, we think about your book, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, proposes democratic remedies uh, for democratic problems uh, and, and democracy in America and, and looks to uh, family, looks to religion, looks to uh, local politics, local government as ways in which we elevate ourselves above all of the vices of democracy, the turning in, uh, the flattening out, the, you know, the, the, the tyranny of opinion and sort of giving people ways to see themselves uh, free in society and, and actually capable uh, functioning uh, citizens. Uh, at the beginning of our country, James Madison has this idea of Republican remedies for Republican diseases. So not, not, not necessarily to put you in that same category, of all, although you may yet prove yeah, to please, be, uh, <laughs> you may yet prove to be worthy of such no, distinction. No, no, that's. You have proposed in a decentralizing, diffusive society, deconsolidating society, uh, remedies that would draw upon that same movement yeah. rather than, rather than push against, uh, push against the stream. Uh, but just it, it's curious to me in thinking about. Yeah, and so, and I know we've been talking about that, but uh, you know, where do you think this starts to break through? Um, uh, I mean, in, in uh, politically, do, or does it break through any anytime soon? I mean, I guess that's a hard question to answer, yeah. but uh, we, you know, I have to ask it. Yeah, well, so first of all, I'd say the the analogy is very explicit for me, and I make it explicit in the book that I think the lesson to learn in this moment from from Tocqueville and from Madison. So we have to think about what can change and what is not likely to change, what's really the generative fact, as Tocqueville puts it. Um, and that, that fragmentation, that fracturing or liberalization um, seems to be that kind of fact, at least at this point. And that means we need to look for solutions that use the strengths of a diverse society to address the problems of a fractured society, um, and rather than thinking that we could reverse the trends. Uh, and so that's true. That is, in a sense, what I try to do. Um, I do think it breaks through. I think it breaks through because it enables uh, people who offer solutions like this. And I think there would be left-wing and right-wing versions of these. I obviously am more drawn to the latter, to the conservative approach. I think it's more natural for conservatives. But that there would be a kind of um, a kind of public options progressivism that I lay out just very briefly in the book. Um, the appeal of these, of both a decentralizing conservatism and a more uh, option-driven progressivism, is that they would speak to both 21st century problems and 21st century habits. Um, I think they would they would seem to voters to be much more plausible than um, than the kinds of backward-looking solutions. So you, you said before that you find a lot of younger people just expect government to solve their problems. I think there's a lot of truth to that, but it's also the case that people across the political spectrum now basically believe that government is incompetent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the basic assumption is government works very poorly. And I think that creates an opening for people who want to offer a different way to think about how government should do what it does, particularly because that different way is a 21st century way of thinking about our problems. Now, it's also an 18th century way, right? It's also, uh, it's also federalism also very much in line with our constitutional logic. But I think that the, the great appeal of it is that it's a return to those roots that is also a form of modernization. Um, and I think the, the politician that is able to articulate that, that is able to make the argument that we're going to solve our problems better by making government look more like the institutions we have that do work, um, could really break through. Um, and, and really could begin to make a case for changing how we think about public policy. I think that person is likely to be a relatively young and fairly conservative politician in the coming years, but you never know. Um, and, you know, it, it does seem to me that, in any case, that sort of argument, especially in the wake of this just cratering of, uh, of our politics in this election year, I think there's a real opening uh, for that kind of case. Yeah, no, let, let, let us all hope. We've been talking with Yaval Levin, author of The Fractured Republic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast 
that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.